Tis the season of giving, and one financial services company wants to give the gift of cash. Motley Fool Money starts now. I'm Chris Hill, and back by popular demand. Motley Fool Senior Analyst Jason Buzzer. Thanks for being here. Popular demand you sit on a throne of lies. <laughs> I, I, I could only wish that were the case, but uh, I'm happy to be here nonetheless. Let's begin with Robinhood, shall we? Because the stock trading app is trying to broaden its offerings. And this week rolled out something that caught our attention. Yeah. For anyone who opens an individual retirement account on their platform, Robinhood is offering to match 1% of the funds that customers contribute. The catch is you have to keep the retirement funds with Robinhood for at least five years to get the match. I kind of like that. I, you know, as a uh, someone, uh, and you're with me, and everyone here at the Motley Fool, we really focus on long-term investing. So I like that for customers. Do you like this for Robinhood and their shareholders? Um, I, well, ultimately, ultimately, yes. I mean, I think you're right. I mean, this is regardless. This is a this is a really positive message, right? I mean, this is the kind of thing we love to see. Um, it, it is encouraging folks to think longer term, start preparing for retirement. Um, Robinhood's demographic does skew a little a little younger, and, and so that I think is important to remember as well. Because I mean, you're, you're trying to educate younger investors, give them that mindset of thinking in the context of many many years, uh, as opposed to quarters. Um, but but generally speaking, yeah, I, th- I think it. You know, I liken this kind of to a rewards program for credit cards. And my only concern, I don't know, like one percent. I don't know that one percent is going to be enough to really push meaningful, um, meaningful results from this, but it is a good first step. And I think for Robinhood, you know, the key for them in, in, in their line of work, I mean, it's once you get these account holders, and they've got twenty-three million funded accounts. I mean, it's not it's not a small operation. Um, you know, as as we we say with banking, and I mean, typically with financial services, the longer that you stick with those particular providers, there's switching costs that grow over time. You don't want to bother with extricating yourself from your banking relationship or your investing relationship, and so you tend to kind of just make do. Um, and I think that this is something that certainly could play into their favor if if they are able to grow that that uh, account user base, those funded accounts. Um, once you get those account holders in there, then it really that that's kind of the hard work. Then it really just becomes about adding more services for those account holders, bringing more value to the platform. And that's what this seems like is, is just one more small step in attempting to bring more value to the platform. And, and yeah, I think that's a good thing. If we're going to give Robinhood credit for trading fees basically going to zero, and I think they deserve some, if not all of that credit. For sure. Do you think we could see history repeating itself? Do you think in the next year or two, some other financial services firm, a larger one, maybe with more customers, offers this? This is a one-time deal. It's like, hey, this is not year after year. This is not a 401k plan where we're just going to keep matching every time you put in money. It's a one-time thing. Could you see others doing it? I, I'm glad you you bring that up because I absolutely do. I mean, I think uh, definitely Robinhood deserves a lot of if not all of the credit for really spearheading the 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 dwindling cost and ultimately bringing commission costs to zero um and and the one the one thing when you look at this space it's obviously it's a very large space and this is this is going to be something that really particularly focuses on um, the retail investor, right? I mean, if you're if you're a, an employee of a company and you have a traditional retirement plan, I mean, that's going to be more meaningful than than the limitations that an IRA uh, typically has. But it, it, to me, yeah, I kind of go back to that. I liken it to rewards program for credit cards, and, it, and to me, it feels like there's no reason in the world why other brokerages wouldn't see this as an opportunity to try something new and attempting to bring more value to their platforms. Because again, it really, you know, it it is about keeping those account holders that you have. Um, and also coming up with new reasons for new account holders to consider giving you a shot, and, and you're going to look to the platforms that are charging you the least, 
And now they're all kind of on the same same playing field there. Uh, and then and then you look for the platforms that are going to offer you the most in in the way of value, whether it's matching on an IRA, uh, whether it is research, right? We're seeing public.com, for example, uh, building out more and more research and, and advice uh, for their for their brokerage platform. And, and so I think that between the two of them, between Robinhood and public and, and their ilk, I think that you're going to see more and more of this um, as time goes on, because ultimately, yes, it really is about creating the platform that brings the most value. We've talked about how important the holiday season is for retailers, and we've also talked about the increase in buy now, pay later. And these two stories have merged because Forbes Advisor surveyed 1,000 Americans who have used buy now, pay later at least once to get a sense of what the usage might look like over the next few weeks. A couple of things from the survey, Jason. 64% said they will use buy now, pay later this holiday season. 40% said they will use it for a purchase under $100. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like this is the scene in the action movie where one of the characters says, I've got a bad feeling about this. <laughs> yeah, I kind of I, I kind of feel that way myself. Um, it, you know, when you when you look, I'm not surprised to see more and more people resorting to using BNPL. Um, I, I've, I've never personally used it. Have you? I have not, yeah. despite being offered the chance multiple times. Yeah, to me, I mean, you know, a couple of reasons why I never use it. I mean, one is I just have a good credit card with a good rewards program, but then two, it just it, it feels like just, and I've not gone through experience, so I'm sure maybe there's 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 I'm, I'm over over reading reading too much into it, but it feels like the process of using buy now, pay later is just, it feels like there's more friction involved. It feels like it's just a a more difficult experience than just checking out with PayPal or your credit card. But um, nevertheless, I mean, I I do, I do feel like this is something that could end badly. I mean, when you look at, you look at the broader data, just the broader consumer data, and we were talking about this, I think on the radio show on Friday, uh, you've got now this year, you've got, you've got more Americans living paycheck to paycheck, right? 60% versus 56% a year ago. Uh, we've got the personal saving rate, essentially it, it, what it looks like an all time low at 2.3% now. Um, it, in, in, you see credit card balances that are set to cross over $1 trillion for the first time ever. Now you add that to to the options there with buy now pay later. I mean, buy now pay later just seems to be another lifeline when you're running out of options. And and I guess that's good, but it certainly isn't ingraining, I think, responsible consumer behavior. I mean, if if you have to stretch out, you know, purchase under a hundred dollars like that. You know, maybe rethink the purchase. You know, I don't know. I mean, I know that obviously inflation is, is, is uh, causing a, a lot of a lot of angst for a lot of consumers out there. But you know, I mean, there 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 is there is data out there. I mean, there have been studies conducted. I mean, there was a study by conducted by researchers at the University of Washington, uh, University of California, Irvine, and the Singapore Management University. They found, and this is a recent study that that you know, buy now pay later services. Using buy now pay later services results in shocker more bank overdraft charges, more credit card charges, and more credit card late fees. And all three of those are bad. All three of those impact consumers' financial health negatively. Um, and and then furthermore, they forecast that spending with buy now pay later is projected to reach. And I threw that one trillion dollar number out there for for credit card balances. Spending with with buy now pay later is projected to reach one trillion dollars by twenty twenty five. So this is not going away. I mean, this is something that is becoming very meaningful. Um, and and for consumers, I think it, it's just it, it's imperative that you really spend wisely, spend thoughtfully. Right? I mean, it, it's one thing to have these lifelines, but but understand the debt that you're taking on and the responsibility that exists in in, in needing to pay it back. Yeah, the big ticket items, I can see it. Yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of. Di- I mean, this is this is a pretty comprehensive survey that Forbes Advisor commissioned. Um, so there are a lot of data points. That's the one that leaped out to me. The the, the 40 percent saying they're going to use it for a purchase under a hundred dollars because yeah. that's that's when I said I've been offered multiple times. There are more and more sites that are just offering that when you go to check out, it's just sort of like, oh, here's this thing. You're you know. 
I'm buying a single item for $25. Would you like to spread that out over four payments? Yeah. No, I got the $25. Yeah. 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 That. And I mean, restaurants, you know, you see, you see a lot of data that, that shows that people are using it to, to go out to eat, which again, I just, I mean, I, I know that the times are tough. Um, it just, yeah, I, I don't take on debt if you don't have to, I guess. Jason Moser, thanks for being here. Thank you. Sticking with the broad spectrum of financial services, when businesses need to build systems to accept payments, some of those businesses turn to Indava. The company's had its stock cut in half this year, but Indava is still growing revenue and has positive free cash flow. Motley Fool senior analyst Asit Sharma caught up with Indava CEO John Cottrell to talk about digital payment trends and what makes his company different from the competition. So, John, I wanted to begin by asking you to describe Indava for those Motley Fool members who may not be familiar with your company. Sure. So, um, we sit in that exciting space of uh, technology, uh, essentially helping our clients adopt uh, technology waves that are rolling through their industries. Uh, and we do focus on industries that are uh, experiencing substantial uh, technology driven change. Um, and so, you know, the way in which we do that is through multidisciplinary teams that um, help our clients to play around with technology, find things that are going to make a difference to their business, to their business models, to their uh, consumer relationships, uh, prototype it, get it into production, scale it as it's successful. Uh, we do that with a delivery model that includes people from nearshore locations in Latin America and in Central Europe. Um, so that we can offer, you know, exciting change to clients, but with also a, a reasonably competitive price point. So in this industry, which uh, is characterized by finding great talent and having that talent help other companies, how would you say that Indava is differentiated by some other players? I think across the spectrum, we've got some very large tech consulting companies and we've got some smaller players uh, like your company, which are more specialized. If you were to describe what makes Indava different to a prospective client and to our full audience, how would you do that? Yeah, so I, I think one of the most important things is that uh, space of helping clients take uh, product ideas using new technologies from ideation through to production and then scale in the markets as they're successful. Uh, and we do that with multidisciplinary teams. So we we pull together uh, not just engineers who can build software and build technology into solutions, uh, but also the creatives and the designers uh, who think about the usability, think about the uh, the clients, the customers who are going to be using the systems. How do you make that an exciting experience for them? Um, when you twine all of these things together, uh, you end up with products that are much more exciting in the market. Uh, and that's what we offer our clients. That's why they keep coming back. For more, uh, as a result of that, we end up with large-scale clients with long-term relationships uh, where they're growing what they do with us. Uh, and that becomes a major point of differentiation for us. Uh, each year, um, about 60% of our growth comes from our existing clients spending more. And then we're just topping up a little bit on top with some new clients where we're doing some of that ideation work uh, to get them into understanding how Indava operates and um, start using us. Indava has seen great success in the financial and payments sector. Yeah. Uh, it's a large part of your revenue. I was hoping you could explain to our members uh, what your core competencies are in this space. Yeah, so the financial services space is where we started. Essentially, the business started in uh, 2000. Uh, we were focused on the city of London uh, with all of the payments and financial services and investment banking communities that exist in London. Uh, so that's where we started. It's where we um, learned our spurs um, coming up to 23 years ago now. Um, but as we've grown, we've, we've scaled the business outside of the UK and outside of financial services. Um, but as you, as you rightly call out, the uh, financial services space is our core. It's still around half of our revenues um, is, is in the financial services space. 
Uh, the big um, area that uh, has grown for us has been in the payments area. Essentially, uh, over the last 20 years, it's, there's been a big shift from people paying by physical means, whether that's uh, cash or checks, uh, moving into the electronic space with, with cards, with uh, increasingly with real-time payments that interact directly with your bank account, um, and building those solutions and capabilities for clients, um, as well as you know the large transaction stuff that happens in the um, in the banking world and helping all, all of that volume back end um, that occurs with clients. Um, it's part of that capability that we bring together, that, that ability at the front end to be ideating new product and bringing the creative to bear on what a new product would be, right through to the um, you know building large systems that are highly scalable, highly resilient um, in the transaction space. You put those two things together, you get, you get products that are exciting to use, but then when you get them in the market, they work. It, it would seem there are many years ahead to plumb this space. I was thinking of a company, a uh, fellow company that's domiciled in the UK, Wise PLC, oh, yes. and uh, just the challenges they're trying to solve in terms of cross-border payments, plugging sometimes directly into uh, the treasury function of some co uh, countries. It, it would seem that you've got a lot that you can still um, parlay into growth. Was curious, have you developed any of these competencies that you can then lift and shift into other verticals as you've worked uh, so many years in financials and uh, payments? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, it's one of the areas where we're seeing uh, substantial interest and growth. Uh, particularly as uh, the sort of open banking and the um, the regulatory rules are opening the platforms up a little bit. Uh, you're seeing other sectors who uh, use payments. Obviously, if you're a retailer, there's everything uh, that you sell goes through a payment system. And actually, retailers end up with very complex payment systems uh, spread um, uh, across the globe. Uh, and being able to help them design uh, new solutions that are still using banks and payment processes at the back end, but enables them to orchestrate what they're doing, uh, get much better customer information uh, out of the transactions that they're doing, uh, is an area where using our payments expertise, we're then able to help retailers. Um, we see it across a number of uh, sectors. There's, there's insurance where uh, micropayments are coming in. So, you know, ensuring the journey rather than the car uh, type shifts in the way in which uh, insurance is working. Uh, mobility is a space, making the car the payment device. So when you park it, uh, it sorts out the car parking fee rather than you having to go to a machine. All of these trends which are coming down the line. Uh, are actually ones where we're able to work with clients in those different industries around how the payments back end can uh, help them drive a, a frictionless solution, essentially, from a customer point of view. So this is a good segue into my next uh, question, because you've mentioned uh, many technologies that seem next generation, alluding to things like uh, telematics in uh, the insurance industry. Endava has a well-deserved reputation for being sort of a next-generation type company, uh, looking to help clients bridge uh, where they can grow in the future. But one thing that strikes me about your company is that the approach is, is very pragmatic. Uh, for example, uh, you have some uh, developing services in the metaverse, but it's not uh, what most people would recognize as sort of the, the hyped version of the metaverse to me, it's more of uh, plumbing to help companies that may potentially play, let's say, in virtualization, um, et cetera. So could you talk a little bit about what next generation means to you? Uh, and then maybe we'll, we'll plumb that a little further. Sure. I mean, it means different things for different technologies. But as you say, our, um, our approach is very pragmatic. It starts from that prototyping um, approach that we take with clients where... Um, if we if we think there's a technology can have an impact on their business, the first thing we do is prototype what it might look like. Now that immediately takes you into the pragmatic place because you're not envisioning something on PowerPoint or something. You're actually showing a working solution. 
Um, and then as the client sees that, they get excited about it. We then start scaling it into being real product. Um, I mean, the talking about the metaverse, we had our first client metaverse event last month, um, which I was actually slightly nervous about whether the metaverse was ready for it. Um, but it was actually an amazing experience uh, to actually stand on a stage in the virtual world with a with a uh, a load of avatars out there listening to you and feel like you had a real audience. Um, and then after the event, uh, drop down into the into the auditorium and have real conversations with people who looked at you and you spoke to them and responded. Um, and and you know we're working on the technologies that bring human emotion into those avatars. Um, and just make the experience more and more real. Um, so there's a way to go on the metaverse. You know, this is not something that um, is is going to feel like a real life experience uh, in the next year or two. Um, but it is something companies are starting to work with, um, so that they get the experience and uh, the familiarity with the sorts of things that you can do, and then start creating product that's coming through. And there's a there's so many um, technologies that are coming through where that evolution has some way to run. Whether whether you're talking about autonomous vehicles, uh, frictionless payments, we've already mentioned the things you can do with 5G and um, and the Internet of Things, and the connectivity that's going to bring, and and uh, the sorts of products that that will bring out, uh, language, AI. Um, all of those things are, are going to bring new technologies that sweep across industries and create a lot of change. Uh, it's, in, it's interesting. I, I uh, love a, a Bill Gates quote, which he, he stole from someone else, um, which is that in the, in the short term, uh, people imagine technology is going to have uh, an impact, and they're obviously a little bit disappointed by how quickly that happens. Um, but in the long term, people can't even imagine the depth of impact and the and the level of impact that a new technology that's coming through is going to have. Uh, and I, I think you see that with the uh, with the internet. You know, um, 20 years ago, there was all the excitement about it. Uh, it then calmed down a little bit, and then you saw the change come through in the following 10 years or so. And we're hitting a, a whole bundle of new technology areas where that's what's going to be coming through over the next 20 or 30 years. As always, people on the program may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against. So don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear. I'm Chris Hill. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow. Well, it's December. It's not even cold. I wake in a sweat, just counting on when.